we're supposed to video journal. We had a meeting tonight, the three of us, um, just touching base on how everything's going and uh, dealing with some of the interpersonal relationships um, with the three of us and some miscommunications that had occurred recently. But the meeting was good. It's really long <laughs> and I'm really tired now, but it was great. And Barbara and Ingrid worked out their drama um, between each other. And we talked about our upcoming panel, um, some of the story <laughs> storylines um, for the episode. <laughs> That's Cora. <laughs> um, and we just got some, some good info, uh, open and communicated. I had such a long day today. I just feel completely wiped. Um, but I'm really <laughs> looking forward to having this panel over. It's like, it's like a gnawing thing on my shoulder, just constantly reminding me, oh, hey, don't forget, you're going to be super uncomfortable pretty soon for a pretty long time in front of a bunch of people you don't know. I recently heard a really interesting story on NPR, and I thought I would share it because it was really relevant for this particular topic. Uh, what's his name? Adam Savage, you know who that is? He hosts Mythbusters. And he was on The Moth recently, and they aired it on NPR, um, on KCRW, and I just loved the story. And if you didn't hear it, it's basically him telling a story of how he explains sex to his sons, his 10-year-old twin sons. And he's a really funny guy, but he sums it up in such a beautifully simple way that I've never really thought about before, a better way to go about explaining it to them, but also directly responding to the fact that they're dealing with something that's completely different than his generation or generations before him, and that was the internet. He says, son, the thing about sex is that on the internet, it hates women. If the internet was a person and it was a dude, that dude would have a problem with women. And that rang really true to me. It specifically rang true because they're so much more influenced by images they see on the internet than, than I ever was growing up. And I'm, I've definitely grown up in an internet age myself, but it's nothing compared to what it is now. And I think that the relevancy of the fact that if the internet was a person, that's not a very nice person. Because the way the internet treats women is really abusive and really vile. And unfortunately, women are disrespected on the internet every couple minutes. Um, you don't see it as much with men, but it's there with men, you know, which is why we look to people like Adam Savage and educators and speakers and professionals and professors because they have a really good way of saying things and a really nice way of communicating with the rest of the world. But if we can only do one thing to try and change the way women are treated, even if just online, it's talk about it. There's really nothing else we can do but talk about it. So, Life of an Artist presents Feminism Today, Art and Life. Nicole Hebron, she's on the cover of Artillery this month. Um, she's an interdisciplinary artist and assistant professor at Chapman University in Orange. She's the founder of LA Art Girls, the former co-founder of the Artist Collective, the Elizabeths, and contributing editor for Extra Magazine, really high-end magazine. Carrie Yuri, um, head of research and insights at Beyond Curious Inc., and she writes for the Huffington Post a lot. Um, she's also a nationally exhibited fine artist, mother, and wife. 
Dr. Joanna Rich, published poet and professor of art history at Cal State University Fullerton. She's a specialist in contemporary art and modern art, theory and practice in new media, methods, and historiography. Our zoo, Arda Kosar, is an international artist, founder of Yarn Bobbing Los Angeles. She's also the co-founder of Tran Trans Istanbul Collective that worked with inner city youth in Istanbul, Turkey, and co-founder of International Survey of Alternative Art Scene that examined art practices outside the museum gallery system in different parts of the world. Today, this afternoon, actually, I was talking with a friend who, who happened to be a very straight white male artist, and um, we were talking about the Gallery Tally project that's covered in the artillery issue right now, and it's a crowdsourced project that's now almost 450 participants from around the world, and we're carrying in it, and we're, and we're working on making posters that visualize the gender statistics of uh, the stable of artists in each of these galleries. We have 100 galleries in LA and 200 in New York. And um, this friend of mine said to me, he's like, well, you know, uh, people, people, it's never attributed. People are saying that you're just doing this project because you're upset at your own lack of success in the gallery world. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> so it's really like, it, it, which to me seemed like a totally sexist, like it couldn't possibly be because 450 people and I want to talk about this. There are the, you know, and I'm not winning any friends by doing it. It's not like I'm going to get any better gallery representation. <laughs> it's not right. <laughs> and it also presumes that my model of success as an artist is predicated on this very patriarchal object sales, like object driven sales based things in galleries, rather than this model, like a more socialist or feminist or collaborative model that is about generating kind of an experience or creating a platform for dialogue, none of which is commodifiable. It's like, unless you identify your practice within this realm of this commodifiable system, the, the metrics for success are completely down. So what feminist art does is, like feminism, it is consciously trying to create a model of interaction, a social conduct, let's say, that is very different from the one set up with patriarchy. It's more egalitarian, and it is intended to liberate both men and women from oppressive models, and that's not just gender roles or cultural, social forms of conduct, but also financial. And the power of that feminist art is that it has already succeeded and has already succeeded in the past in showing us what is possible. I don't think there's anything wrong with making a career of selling and making feminist artwork. I think that's fabulous, and I wish more of us could do that, but I just think that there are very few people who are who are art stars who are, who are doing that. I mean, right. you and I think of two or three of them, right? It's not wrong. No, no, it's great, but there's not the market for it. Right. Um, yeah, so I worked for a year as a curator, the chief curator of contemporary art at the Utah Museum of Contemporary Art in Salt Lake City, and uh, I, my name when seen in print looks like Michael, and I, I discovered over the course of the first several months that I was there pretty immediately and really overtly that when I emailed artists or other institutions to borrow works or to collaborate with them on exhibitions, uh, in email the response was very deferential and, oh, Mr. Hebron. We would be so delighted, blah, 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 this very kind of appeasing. And as soon as I got on the phone with people and they heard that I was a woman, or if I corrected them in the email and said, no, I'm a female, the language shifted. And not just once, it happened over and over again. The language shifted to one of telling me what to do, telling me what the show should be instead, making recommendations, negotiating, all that. Like, and, and I realized for the first time, I was like, whoa, I, I was living for a minute like I, with a male voice, this male authoritative <laughs> voice. And the access and the deference that was given to that imagined voice was so different than when I spoke as a woman. And that, so that's like the most immediate and egregious observation that I've come across. So if there are hundreds. When Nicole mentioned the discriminating treatment that she received 
based on the trouble with her name looking like a man's name, I definitely related. Having a name like Evan doesn't exactly make it easy for people to know that I'm a woman when I'm communicating by email or phone or text or letters. Um, and in my business, as an editor of a magazine, I am never in person with people. You know, I'm always on emails, phone calls. So when people learn that my name is Evan and I'm Evan, they immediately start treating me differently. I get uh, explained things in a, in a more uh, simple way. I get, um, oh, I'm being sensitive about my name, that I'm sure I've had issues over the years. Um, that I may be considered bossy or bitchy because I'm stern and forceful, whereas before I was just Evan. <laughs> but now I'm a woman named Evan, and that creates a lot more dissonance in the way that people want to treat me. It's definitely been my longest discriminating experience um, that I've had in my life, having been Evan for such a long time. But why do you think and they prefer it? Like, well, I think that it? I think they see. I think it's uh, they see more art by young men. I think that the opportunities, the the kind of grow. I don't know what the right word is. I mean, I think there is this like fraternity kind of attitude where like you're more people in existing galleries are probably more likely to recommend. That's what I was going to say. How do people get gallery representation? Either their professors recommend them or right. they become somebody's assistant, studio assistant, right. and therefore they get to interact with all these gallery people. Or it is an uh, artist recommending somebody else, or a critic starts writing about someone and then it you know, becomes prominent for them to look into. So is it because these young men are doing work that is more easily commodifiable, so therefore the gallery system would accept it? Or is it because when a professor thinks about their best student to recommend or an artist, are they then? I don't know. I, I would love to know. I don't know. In your experience in the galleries that you've worked at, do you show more men or women? Well, let me put it this way, actually. This is something that I can actually speak to. For art to get into a gallery, not for someone to create art, but for art to get into a gallery, it has to be, for the most part, of a caliber where that person has had the time and inclination to create a body of work, not a single body of work, but sometimes the 10th, 20th, 100th incarnation of a body of work that finally is successful enough to be commercially viable. Galleries are commercial spaces. They're not intellectual spaces. And um, galleries are not necessarily as keen on exploring social issues that won't translate into a sale. Or the thing that I heard a lot was, well, women just aren't as good at promoting themselves. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, because like I'm I'm in for tenure right now, and the number one complaint or you know kind of point against me in the front of my chair was that I speak out and I'm an emotional teacher. Um, What's your chair? And I think that's true. So it's like when women speak out or they're self-promoting, they're they're uh, considered bitchy and aggressive, right? And when men do it, they're considered assertive and go get her. I think it's really difficult for a lot of women to um, to make it in the art world for a, a, a number of reasons, but with networking specifically, it becomes this very sensitive game that you have to play as you are selling yourself, selling your work, selling your brand, but you don't want to sell it to the point where you are um, selling too much of yourself. Um, there, there's a fine line between the social interactions that you can have with gallerists, other artists, curators, um, collectors, etc., and personal relationships. And I find that a lot of girls or young women have a difficult time drawing lines with those relationships, and it becomes very difficult. It's a really sensitive topic. The thing that's hard for me is how social the art world is. The same issues that we're dealing with in the sense that an independent female is seen as a threat, um, even subconsciously, can permeate the art world in the same manner that it can any other area of society. So the fact that 
artists and galleries and curators are all communicating oftentimes on a social level as well as a professional level. There's a lot of problems that go there. How about other areas of um, uniquely feminine life, like motherhood or marriage? Do those play in any part of success as a female artist, or do they help or hinder the whole goal of feminism in the art world? I feel like in my generation, people don't really talk about the difference between wanting to have children and wanting to raise a child or be a mother and not wanting those things. No one ever, like, no one ever makes you feel okay about it. You can't just, you can't just talk about it to whomever you'd like. Maybe it's too sensitive, maybe it's, too controversial. I always see things online, like op-ed articles saying like, oh, you don't have to have children to be a full woman or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, of course, like, duh. Why would I think that I wouldn't be a full woman just because I don't have children? Like, that's silly. But amongst my friends, you only talk about that with your allies. Like, people you know feel the same way. It's never... It's never with other people. And Ingrid and I actually had a really cool conversation one time um, with our friend Gail in our studio about this very issue. Because Ingrid feels the same way, that it's just not talked about very often, and it's completely okay to not have kids or to have kids, but that desire, that want, that yearn for motherhood is just so complicated and so loaded and so full of confusion and misunderstanding and tropes and stigmas. It's so hard to just, just talk about it. So, um, but I, I think it was, uh, I had a professor um, say in grad school, you know, there is no good time to be pregnant. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness, my goodness, a crying baby. Oh, here's your baby, baby. Oh, sweet thing. Having a child totally does change everything. Because I used to be a part-time faculty, not um, I didn't have a security of a full-time faculty, but then I got pregnant, and then okay, it was kind of okay to I, I, I could skip a semester to teach, and then I went back into teaching maybe when my kid was like two months old, and then it was actually quite a relief because I was teaching evening classes. I was I wanted to teach the classes that nobody else wanted to teach because we did this. Um, like, um, the father of the kid was working the day so I could take care of the kid during the day and I could teach evening and weekend classes that nobody else wants to teach because then we can do this, you know, child care sharing. But then I got pregnant again. And then when they offered me another class and I had to pass again for what, like, I, I wanted to skip a semester. They're like, did you just do that last semester? I'm like, well, I kind of need to, I, I didn't get a job mm. after that. So it's like, okay, now you're out. It's widely known in the art world that being a female artist and having kids are highly incompatible, yet nobody goes out and tells you that you're going to be discriminated against. We pick up on this as young artists through the frowns, snidey comments, and mainly the lack of female artists role models with kids, both in contemporary art and in art history. So, it's nice to hear from the panelists and for women to acknowledge that female artists with kids get discriminated against. Uh, it was an interesting discussion on why and how, and little has changed since some of these female artists 
had their kids. So it will be a struggle for sure. And we still live in a, a culture where in the art world in particular, over and over again, artists are kind of put to the side or given less credence when they become a parent or become pregnant. And like all of my friends have kids and, 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 and they're varying ages. So I've watched like friends get, they have their galleries, drop them, have them postpone a show when they get pregnant, have them drop the prices of their work have them say like, oh, well, what are you gonna do now? Never ask those questions of the father if it's a if it's a heterosexual couple that are heavy. They don't ask of the male partner, like, well, how is that gonna affect your, your career? Or are you sure you can handle the next show? You're having a baby, like they never ask that. I guess if I'm really being honest, I'm just scared. I'm scared that having children means sacrificing time in the studio, being written off as just a mom or some housewife. I just don't know what will happen. What do you think about women with children as artists? Are they less reliable or less available? Do they do they cause more trouble as a gallerist? Like, is that a concern for you if they're... No, I, I, one, of, one of our most successful artists just had, was pregnant with her second child. I, I don't think that... Um, having children affects the reliability or the vision of an artist at all. Um, you know, we still see, culturally see pregnancy and motherhood as a, as a liability that, um, you know, and in the art world in particular, but what if it were completely inverted? That if once a woman was pregnant or had a child, they were considered more, their value, their social value increased. And I think when the child is born, like that's that's true, maybe like we become, we, we respect and revere mothers once the child is out of the, <laughs> their stomach. Like you're an artist who is pregnant, like it's sort of like, oh, what's that gonna do to your art? Rather than, what if people said like, oh my God, you're pregnant, hey, your prices are gonna double. <laughs> you know? I do see feminism um, as a launching point, just as we could say the civil rights was a launching point, or the um, war protest movement was a launching point for opening things up. So, uh, you know, from queer theory to issues of race to issues of, um, you know, gender construction, questions of colonialism, nationalism. I mean, I, that's where I see feminism, you know, if you want to sort of and there are many different places. We could go back to the suffragettes, we could go back to the international women of the 20th century, but to keep opening that term up, we want to update them. And I kept thinking, you know, could feminism be defined as a practice of inclusivity that recognizes our human multiplicities and that identity is always complex and conflictual. And, and just the quote that I love from the Pipilati Reese was, I'm always struggling with myself no matter what I do. And to me, that's feminism. It's, it's just, the problem is the labels, the labels get stuck and they don't get unfixed. And I think we're all, as individuals, unfixing them every day. You know, it's a network, right? So it's not a linear trajectory. No one sees life anymore that way, not with the web. You can't. And so I think whatever we can each do in our individual you know, practices uh, as humans is to keep keeping it messy, you know, and, and articulating that as feminism, maybe, so. Pipilotti Reese uh, is a feminist artist, if you're unfamiliar with her work. Um, she works mostly in video uh, and moving image work. Um, a lot of her work uses um, surrealistic and crass uh, images of, of female bodies and she does very interesting installation work as well as um, performance and video based work. Um, she's a very intelligent woman and she has made a huge dent in my uh, studies um, in, in art history and in feminism. Like I think that this like gender studies and queer theory has often been like grouped together as if there's not enough space in the institution right. to talk about all of them right. for each of it to have their own course of, of conversation and study like and I think that's like it's just continuing this like belittling or diminution of theirs of say like the complexity of it is not acknowledged at all I agree and that for, for that reason I am still a, a big proponent of the term feminism because I feel like until half the human race globally has the same rights as right. the other half we need to hold on to that term I, I just feel this right I see feminism as amplifying and expanding, not taking away from. And I think that's a fundamental shift, whether 
you know, it's a generational change, but I think we're, things are uh, shifting, and I see the college age, and I don't have much interaction with high school students anymore, but I, I do think it's an expanded consciousness of not oppositional, not binaristic men versus women, and redefining feminism, not replacing it with another word, but continuing to, as I said, remind people that it's an opening up. We decided to do the feminist panel to help us better understand where feminism has come from and where it's going. It's a relevant topic to all of us, especially in the arts, but we learn better through personal experiences. And I think that the women on the panel really helped us get a good sense of where feminism is today in the arts. Um, it's not a journey that's going to end anytime soon. This investigation of feminism and feminist art practice um, are relevant in our uh, larger investigation of the female journey uh, to success in the art world. But this panel is definitely going to help us um, understand that journey a little bit better. And I think it was successful. I think we helped a lot of other people um, kind of get a grip on the concept of feminism as it is today. <laughs>